All right, let's talk about these questions. Question one, Lady Elliot's life and the ideal woman of that society. This was today's most popular question. Every group except one took this question. So let's uh, take a closer look. Um, this is a part of the book that we talked about two weeks ago. Page four. Uh, let's see where it's the 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 paragraph begins his good looks and his rank. Line three. Lady Elliot had been an excellent woman, sensible and amiable, whose judgment and conduct, if they might be pardoned, the youthful infatuation which made her Lady Elliot, had never required indulgence afterwards. So, good personality, good judgment, good behavior. Only one time acted outside the expectations is when she fell in love with Sir Walter. But even after getting married, she fell right back in line as the ideal woman. She had humored or softened or concealed his failings and promoted his real respectability for 17 years. So she did the duties of a good wife, protected her husband's reputation, promoted his good name and his good deeds. And though not the very happiest being in the world herself, so her, she herself is not very happy, which means she's not happy. This is a euphemism, wei wan si. Not the very happiest means not happy. Had found enough in her duties, her friends and her children to attach her to life and make it no matter of indifference to her when she was called on to quit them. So she had her duties taking care of the house, she had her friends and she had her children to take care of. And all of these made her feel like life is worth living. Uh, it, in the morning, it's worth getting out of bed. Uh, and it also made her feel like when she was about to die, it truly is something sad to have to lose all of these. So she's not the happiest person, but she doesn't want to kill herself. Um, so if this is the ideal woman in that society, we can see that uh, as we discovered uh, when I was talking with you guys, the society cares about women in terms of their husbands, their children, their household, and at the very bottom of the list, herself, her happiness, her own friends. Um, so we see here a classic situation where the person does not fit with the society. And there are two ways you can solve that problem. You can change the society or you can change the person. Jane Austen seems to want to give us the idea that it is the society that should change. It uh, she tells us Lady Elliot was not happy and then she died. Later on, we'll see that Anne is also not happy, and her solution is to let Anne marry the man of her dreams. So it seems like whatever is making these women sad in society should be changed. Uh, Austin does not consider whether it might be better for these women to find a different perspective on their life and to try to seek happiness wherever they can or in whatever way they can. Um, and that's part of the romance of the novel, right? It's partly why we like to read and listen to stories, because they're not like real life. There are many similarities, but in some important parts, they are better than real life. Uh, so, you know, reading literature can give us hope, can give us a different imagination of what life could be like or what kind of goal you might set for your own life. Um, whether it's like what you read or whether uh, the thing that you read makes you think of something else. It gives us a direction. Either toward or away. Question two, society standards of beauty. One group chose this question. Let's look at page five. The paragraph beginning, it sometimes happens. It, 
it sometimes happens that a woman is handsomer at 29 than she was 10 years before. We also looked at this two weeks ago. And generally speaking, if there has been neither ill health nor anxiety, it is a time of life at which scarcely any charm is lost. So charm is lost. It's possible that a woman at 29 doesn't look as beautiful, but according to Jane Austen, uh, or according to this part of the story, that only happens when the woman gets sick or suffers from anxiety, which is their way of talking about mental health. So we see that beauty is connected with health. If a woman is in good health physically and mentally, she may be even more beautiful at 29 than she was at a younger age. It was so with Elizabeth. So this is the case with Elizabeth. Still the same handsome Miss Elliot that she had begun to be 13 years ago. So she was neither sick uh, physically or mentally. Uh, so she is just as beautiful as before. And Sir Walter might be excused, therefore, in forgetting her age, or at least be deemed only half a fool for thinking himself and Elizabeth as blooming as ever amidst the wreck of the good looks of everybody else. So let's look at that first part. Sir Walter might be excused in forgetting her age. So if Sir Walter looks at Elizabeth and forgets that Elizabeth is already 29, now we know why, because she looks just as beautiful as before. Continuing, or at least be deemed only half a fool for thinking himself and Elizabeth as blooming as ever. So if Sir Walter looks at Elizabeth and he thinks, oh, she looks just as good as before, and then he thinks of himself and he says, oh, I look just as good as before. He's only half a fool. Uh, the, so like he gets it half right. So yes, Elizabeth is still beautiful. So this is actually telling us that Sir Walter doesn't look as good as he used to. But why would he think this? Amidst the wreck of the good looks of everybody else. Because according to Sir Walter, everybody else looks even worse. For he could plainly see how old all the rest of his family and acquaintance were growing. Anne Haggard, which means tired looking. Mary Coarse, which means not as delicate anymore. Every face in the neighborhood worsting, which means getting worse. And the rapid increase of the crow's foot about Lady Russell's temples had long been a distress to him. The temple is the side of your head next to your eyes, Taiyang Shui. And the crow's foot is describing her forehead, her hairline, her hair, out of fashion. There's it, it's going in uh, near her temples. So, in other words, he's saying Lady Russell looks older and older. But notice how he describes Anne and Mary. Anne looks tired. She looks haggard. Why do you think Anne would look tired? Maybe because she is the person who really who's really worrying about her house, who's really taking care of everything. Maybe because after she rejected Captain Wentworth, she had a fever and an illness. Why would Sir Walter describe Mary as coarse, not delicate? Chu Guangde. Maybe because she married a gentleman instead of a noble. She married somebody of a lower status. So Sir Walter might think of her as less delicate. So we see here the standards of beauty are related to health, physical health, mental health, and also status. According to Sir Walter, the lower someone's status, the worse they look. 
Now, we know we shouldn't always trust Sir Walter's judgment. He's a very poor judge of character. But it is true that most of the people in this high class, in this part of society, do care very much about status. If value, sorry, if beauty is a sign of value, then a lower status means a lower value should mean less beauty. So it could be that the logic makes sense. Sir Walter's logic that the higher status someone is, the more beautiful they are, could make sense. But because it's Sir Walter, he thinks that he and Elizabeth have the highest status. Therefore, they are the most beautiful people. Whereas later on, we will see that Sir Walter is not really that high status. He's like in the middle. Question three, why does Lady Russell disapprove of Mrs. Clay? Let's take a look, page 11. Oh, sorry, that's page 13. <laughs> page 11. Last paragraph. Lady Russell had another reason, uh, another excellent reason at hand for being extremely glad that Sir Walter and his family were to remove from the country. Remove just means move away. Elizabeth had been lately forming an intimacy or a friendship, which Lady Russell wished to see interrupted. It was with a daughter of Mr. Shepherd. Mr. Shepherd is Sir Walter's lawyer, uh, and a lawyer is not a noble. He's just a regular gentleman. So the daughter is also not a noble. Well, with a daughter of Mr. Shepherd, who had returned after an unprosperous marriage to her father's house with the additional burden of two children. Uh, British people back there spelled burden with a TH, but it just means burden. Uh, 负担. Okay, so what is this sentence telling us? Unprosperous marriage means that her husband was neither high status nor was he rich. He had nothing really to give her. And it says that she returned after a marriage. What does that mean? How do you do something after a marriage? Does that mean she got divorced? No, because you're not allowed to get divorced in that uh, religion, in that society. So it probably means that Mr. Clay died. So Mrs. Clay is now a widow. And then finally, the additional burden of two children. So she doesn't have a status, doesn't have money, and she has two children. Socially speaking, not a good idea, uh, not a good reputation, let's say. Um, also notice it's it calls the children burdens. We're going to come back to that next week. She was a clever young woman who understood the art of pleasing. So she's clever. By the way, the word clever is a negative word in this period. It means you keep thinking of ways to help yourself. Uh, in Chinese, I guess we could say shua xiao tongming. Today, of course, in British English, clever is a more positive word. So she's a clever young woman who understood the art of pleasing, how to please people, how to make people happy. 
the art of pleasing at least at Kellynch Hall. So she knows how to make the people at Kellynch happy. Is that a bad thing? She it says that she knows how to make Sir Walter and Elizabeth happy. This is actually a negative description because it implies that she has to work to make them happy. She herself is not somebody who would naturally make them happy. She's intentionally doing something. She's manipulating them into feeling happy. Is what the language is telling us. And who had made herself so acceptable to Miss Elliot, this is Elizabeth, as to have been already staying there more than once, uh, so sleeping over at the house, in spite of all that Lady Russell, who thought it a friendship quite out of place, could hint of caution and reserve. So Lady Russell thinks that it's not a proper friendship. So Lady Russell keeps suggesting that they should be careful and that they should hold back and shouldn't be so close with Mrs. Clay. But even though she, uh, Lady Russell keeps giving this advice, Elizabeth is very close with Mrs. Clay. So why would, like, what is the danger here? Why would it be a bad idea for Elizabeth to be such a good friend with Mrs. Clay? So this is going back to the question. Low status, no money, two children, fine, doesn't look good. But what's the danger here? If we go back to the ideal woman, right? So Mrs. Shepherd has children. She doesn't have money. She doesn't have a status. Maybe she's looking to improve her life. Maybe she's looking for money. Maybe she's looking for status. Maybe Lady Russell is afraid that Mrs. Clay will somehow end up marrying Sir Walter. And that would be a bad marriage for Sir Walter because Mrs. Clay is not a noble. It's not a good match. And also because Mrs. Clay is working so hard to manipulate them, also probably suggests that they're not a good match uh, in terms of personality, in terms of values. So this is why Lady Russell disapproves of uh, Mrs. Clay walking around Kellynch. Do you agree with her? Well, since nobody took the question, I guess you're asking me. Do I agree? On the one hand, we shouldn't use status to define someone. Just because Mrs. Clay is poor and a commoner does not mean she is a bad person. On the other hand, she's willing to play a role. She's willing to manipulate people in order to try to get what she wants. That is not a good, that is not a sign of a good character. And yet we could also say that she has two children. She needs more resources. It's a question of survival for herself and her family. And uh, questions of survival make people do strange things, but the reason is a good one. So it like the reason I ask these questions is, is because these are open-ended questions. You could go either way depending on what evidence you consider and how important you think the evidence is. So on the one hand, Mrs. Clay is not acting in a very honest and honorable way. On the other hand, she has a good reason not to act so honest about her life. Lady Russell is thinking about this from the point of view of the Elliot family. Is it good for Sir Walter to marry Mrs. Clay? Is it good for Elizabeth and Anne uh, for Mrs. Clay to join the family. 
Uh, so Lady Russell is mostly thinking about status. Uh, and so if that is her only focus, I think that's too narrow. She should consider more dimensions. Um, and if we do consider more dimensions, then we run into the open ended question. Question four, understanding of health. Page 1415. So we talked about beauty being related to health and status. What about health directly? Page 14. Uh, the last paragraph, the really long one. Here they are talking about. Well, I guess Sir Walter is talking about why he doesn't like sailors. Why he doesn't like people in the Navy. Uh, so. Sir Walter is explaining why. Yes, it is in two points offensive to me. I have two strong grounds of objection to it. So he has two reasons to dislike people in the Navy. A ground just means a reason. We still use this word this way today, especially in the law and in philosophy. What grounds do you have just means what reasons do you have? If you ask a lawyer, the lawyer will say, no, 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 grounds and reasons are two different things. But for us normal people, it's the same thing. First, as being the means of bringing persons of obscure birth into undue distinction. So people who were born to nobody. Gain. A reputation that they do not deserve. That's what this means. Obscure means uh, nobody knows in Hoida. Undue means undeserved. Uh, today we use the word due to mean oh, right? You your your deadline is due, your homework is due. You're supposed to give in, you're supposed to hand in your homework. But due means uh what it usually means is um you owe something to somebody. Somebody should have something. So here it means deserved. Undue, undeserved. Distinction. Uh, just means good name or good reputation. The root of the word is uh, distinct, distinguish. The idea is that you can tell that this person is different. And here the difference is a good difference. So the first reason Sir Walter doesn't like the Navy, it makes low people high. Yeah. Right, he continues and raising men to honors which their fathers and grandfathers never dreamt of. Same reason, right? Your grandfather is a commoner. Your father is a commoner. Why should you get a higher status just because you're in the Navy? To Sir Walter, this does not make sense. And secondly, as it cuts up a man's youth and vigor most horribly. Uh, so it makes a man look older. It cuts up his youth and it makes a man look more tired. Vigor means energy. Or like. Uh, yeah, energy is a good way to look vigorous means to look energetic. Like. Uh, I guess in Chinese you can call it like nanxing qi gai or something like that. Uh, and then Sir Walter continues to explain. A sailor grows old sooner than any other man. I have observed it all my life. A man is in greater danger in the Navy of being insulted by the rise of one whose father, his father might have disdained to speak to. So this is going back to the undeserved status. If you join the Navy, it's likely that you will be insulted by somebody. Who father. Your own father wouldn't even look at. Does that make sense? 
in Chinese it's something like uh 你加入海军可能会被一个人冒犯到，那个人的父亲也许你自己父亲能看到不看一眼，但现在你却被那个人冒犯到了。And of becoming prematurely an object of disgust himself. Uh, so premature means early, right? So in other words, you might grow old too fast and become disgusting. Then in any other line, this is a comparison, right? Greater danger than in any other line of work, any other profession. We still say this, a line of work is your occupation. So when, when Sir Walter is talking about youth and vigor and health, he's also thinking about status. Uh, and then he tells a short story. One day last spring in town, I was in company with two men, striking instances of what I am talking of. So these are very clear examples of what I'm talking about. Lord St. Ives, whose father we all know to have been a country curate. So this guy is a lord, right? He has become a noble. But his own father was a country curate. He was a, a pastor in the country. So not a noble. Without bread to eat. I was to give place to Lord St. Ives. Give place to means to yield, to, to give up my position uh, for the other person, like to give up my seat or like I have to bow to him first. I have to treat him as higher status than myself. That's what it means to give place. So Sir Walter is saying, I had to give place to this guy. So that's the example of the status changing. Then we have an example of health. And a certain Admiral Baldwin, the most deplorable looking personage you can imagine. It's like the ugliest looking bastard you can imagine. His face, the color of mahogany. Mu. Rug, uh, rough and rugged to the last degree, which means to the extreme degree. Rugged is uh, the same as coarse. All lines and wrinkles, nine gray hairs of a side, which means each side of his head had only nine gray hairs. And nothing but a dab of powder at top. So he's bald and he puts a little powder on his head. In the name of heaven, there's a quotation mark. Did you see this quotation mark? He's quoting somebody. He's saying himself, said I. In the name of heaven, who is that old fellow? Said I to a friend of mine who was standing near. Sir uh, Basil Morley, that he adds the name of his friend. Old fellow, cried Sir Basil, it is Admiral Baldwin. What do you take his age to be? Sixty, said I, or perhaps sixty-two. Forty, replied Sir Basil, forty and no more. Picture to yourself my amazement. I shall not easily forget Admiral Baldwin. I never saw quite so wretched an example of what a seafaring life can do. So wretched is a negative word, right? Terrible, pitiful. Uh, it's like a bad example of like, what I'm talking about, what a, being a sailor can do to you. But to a degree, I know it is the same with them all. So Admiral Baldwin is the worst case, but I know that every sailor suffers something similar. To a degree, to a certain degree, 某种程度. They are all knocked about, like on the boat, right? They're going back and forth, Bei Hailang Paida, knocked about. And exposed to every climate and every weather till they are not fit to be seen. Fit means suitable. So they're, they're so ugly, you can't look at them. It is a pity they are not knocked on the head at once before they reach Admiral Baldwin's age. And to be knocked on the head just means to be killed by, you know, being hit on the head. 
So he's saying these sailors are so ugly they should have died earlier. So when Sir Walter is talking about health, well, he's, he's really talking about beauty. He's saying they don't look healthy. They look old. They look ugly. And when he again, when he's talking about health and beauty, he's still talking about status. Yes, he now has a higher status because he's in the Navy, but his father was a lowly person. Why? It's not real status. Why do I have to respect that status? Sir Walter is thinking. So for Sir Walter and other nobles who think like him, everything ties back to status. Even health. If we read the other uh, accounts of the different characters health, right? Uh, Anne's health, Mary's health, Elizabeth's health, it all goes back to their different status. You can pay attention to that as we keep reading. And question five, how do you describe these three women? Well, last week we met, we uh, read about Elizabeth. Basically, she's very like her father. Very vain. Uh, and because they get along so well, Elizabeth basically has control of the house. She is a proper lady of the house. She is not married, so she's not the ideal woman, but she is ideal socially. In different social situations, she is a good example of what that society cares about. Lady Russell. Well, we just talked about how she judges Mrs. Clay based on status alone. We also learn in these four chapters that Lady Russell persuaded Anne not to marry Captain Wentworth because of the exact same reasons that Sir Walter gave. Captain Wentworth had, at the time had low status and no money. So Lady Russell persuaded Anne, you should at least wait until he makes some money. So we can say that Lady Russell is very attuned to the ideology of her society. She understands what her society cares about. And so in order to protect the people she cares about, she tries to make sure that they follow the ideology. So in terms of solving social problems, Lady Russell is not very creative, but her answers are always the standard correct answers. As for Anne, we already know that she is the only woman of the Elliot family who is still alive and still has a good head on her shoulders. She can see things clearly. She knows what's going on. She knows what the family has to do. And she also still cares about what happened to her and Wentworth. What was it, eight years ago? And she still cares about how Lady Russell persuaded her to reject Wentworth. So really, like Anne, we know is not valued by her family. She kind of has the worst situation. Good person, doesn't fit with her family, treated like dirt. Uh, once tried to marry somebody and was persuaded to cancel. Like the guy didn't abandon her. If the guy ran away, you can't blame Anne, but Anne took advice to reject him. So you can think about how guilty that makes her feel. Um, we also have a very brief mention of Mr. Elliot. Uh, let's look at page six. The movie didn't have time to to talk about this, but the book does. Nine, seven, six. OK. Um, second paragraph she had had. This is talking about Elizabeth. She had had a disappointment, moreover which that book, the, the book of the noble families that Sir Walter loves to read, 
which that book and especially the history of her own family must ever present the remembrance of. Remembrance means memory. And ever means always. So every time she reads the book, every time she reads about her own family, she remembers this disappointment. And in this book, disappointment usually refers to marriage or the possibility of marriage. The heir presumptive, the very William Walter Elliot Esquire, whose rights had been so generously supported by her father, had disappointed her. So, at one point, Mr. Elliot was going to marry Elizabeth, but it didn't work out. She had, while a very young girl, as soon as she had known him to be, in the event of her having no brother, the future baronet meant to marry him. OK, OK, this is a very complicated sentence. The main sentence is she had. Meant to marry him. And then in the middle, we have a lot of extra information. While a very young girl, as soon as she had known him to be the future baronet. And then we have another layer of extra information in the event of her having no brother. So let's rearrange this. While a very young girl, she learned that if she never has a brother, then this Mr. Elliot will become the future Sir Walter. And so she had always expected to marry him. That's what this sentence is saying. In the event of just means if. And her father had always meant that she should. So Sir Walter also supported this marriage. He had not been known to them as a boy. So here we're talking about Mr. Elliot. Uh, they didn't know him as a boy, but soon after Lady Elliot's death, Sir Walter had sought the acquaintance. So after Lady Elliot died, Sir Walter went to look for Mr. Elliot. And though his overtures had not been met with any warmth. We saw the word overtures in Paradise Lost when we were talking about the cannons, Paohu, and the puns and the sarcasm. Here, overture just means gestures of friendship or gestures of family, trying to become closer with someone. And so Sir Walter tried to uh, get to know Mr. Elliot, but Mr. Elliot was not very warm to him, had not been met with any warmth. He had persevered in seeking it. Sir Walter kept on trying, making allowance for the modest drawing back of youth. So he's rationalizing Mr. Elliot's behavior. He's saying, oh, Mr. Elliot isn't responding because he's young and young people tend not to respond so quickly. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's what he's telling himself. To make allowance for means to make excuse for. Or to use something as an excuse. He's using this as the excuse for why Mr. Elliot is not responding. Modest drawing back of youth, so like young people are expected to be more modest. I don't know. And in one of their spring excursions to London, excursion just means a trip, usually for fun. When Elizabeth was in her first bloom, Mr. Elliot had been forced into the introduction. Mr. Elliot had basically they, they caught him, they put him in a situation and introduced Elizabeth to him. He had been forced to meet Elizabeth. He was at that time a very young man just engaged in the study of the law, so he had just begun studying the law. The law is the traditional. Occupation for noble men. And Elizabeth found him extremely agreeable and every plan in his favor was confirmed in his favor does not mean good for him in his favor means choosing him. 
He was invited to Kellynch Hall. He was talked of and expected all the rest of the year, but he never came. The following spring, he was seen again in town, found equally agreeable, again encouraged, invited, and expected, and again he did not come. And the next tidings, tidings means news, news of somebody. And the next tidings were th that he was married. Instead of pushing his fortune in the line marked out for the heir of the house of Elliot, so instead of increasing his fortune by marrying into this noble house. He had purchased independence by uniting himself to a rich woman of inferior birth. So instead of becoming a noble, he became a free man by marrying a rich common woman. So you can expect Sir Walter's reaction. Sir Walter had resented it. Hazdala. And so that's why they don't get along. So this is talking actually about Elizabeth. Elizabeth had expected to marry Mr. Elliot, but she was disappointed two years in a row. This is a part of the story that we don't see in the movie. It adds another layer to Elizabeth's character, to our understanding of her as a woman. OK. Uh, do you have other thoughts about these questions? OK, we still have a little time left. Let's begin reading next week's selection. Next week, please finish up to the end of chapter eight. Four chapters a week. So let's go to page 22. I'll uh, guide you through the beginning of chapter five. Two. Okay. So in the first four chapters, Sir Walter has agreed to rent a place in Bath and to rent out his place, to lease his place to Admiral Croft and Mrs. Croft. And they had agreed to uh, a meeting so that the Admiral and his wife could look at the place and they could agree on how they are able to use this house for how long to set up a rental contract. On the morning appointed for Admiral and Mrs. Croft seeing Kellynch Hall, Anne found it most natural to take her almost daily walk to Lady Russell's and keep out of the way till all was over. This sentence is ironic. The irony is in most natural. Remember, Anne knows that Frederick Wentworth is Mrs. Croft's brother. She knows that they're related, so she doesn't want to talk about it. She wants to avoid that awkwardness and embarrassment. So of course she found it most natural to pick this time to take her walk and to stay away until the end of the meeting. So natural. But then after the semicolon, there's a twist. When she found it most natural to be sorry that she had missed the opportunity of seeing them. So yes, she took her walk. She stayed with Lady Russell, but then she started to re regret it. She Turns out she wants to meet them, but she missed the opportunity. This meeting of the two parties, Chuangfang, party means a group of people. We still use this today uh, in a court of law when one party is suing another party, or when you go to a restaurant and you have a reservation, you will say a party of four. Or the party of like Mr. Shu, right? So this meeting of the two parties proved highly satisfactory and decided the whole business at once. So the whole thing was decided, it was completed. Each lady, so Elizabeth 
and uh, Mrs. Croft. Is it? Yeah, I think it's Elizabeth, right? Okay. Each lady was previously well disposed for an agreement. So even before the meeting, each lady wanted there to be an agreement. Well disposed, they wanted it. And saw nothing, therefore, but good manners in the other. So because they wanted agreement, they only saw the good parts of the other person. And with regard to the gentleman, there was such a hearty good humor, such an open, trusting liberality on the Admiral's side as could not but influence Sir Walter. So the Admiral had such a good personality, was so open and trusting, and liberality means like not restricted by social conventions. He's such a good person that he could not but influence Sir Walter. So Sir Walter was influenced by this personality. Who had besides been flattered into his very best and most polished behavior by Mr. Shepherd's assurances of his being known by report to the Admiral as a model of good breeding. So another bit of irony. Sir Walter was had also been flattered beforehand. So Mr. Shepard kept telling him that uh, the oh, of course the Admiral knows who you are. You have such a great reputation. Of course he knows you're a good man. You come from a good family. Don't worry about that. And because of this flattering, he put on his very best and most polished behavior. So it, this sentence is also uh, again, pointing out Sir Walter's vanity, Zilian. The house and grounds. So here it just means like the land around the house. The house and grounds and furniture were approved. The crofts were approved. Terms, which means the conditions, Tiaojin. Time. Everything and everybody was right. And Mr. Shepherd's clerks were set to work. Remember, Mr. Shepherd is a lawyer. He has law clerks to write things for him. Uh, were set to work without there having been a single preliminary difference to modify of all that this indenture showeth. This indenture showeth is traditional language for a contract of that time. Indenture means contract, showeth just means shows. So this contract shows, this contract says blah, blah, blah. So this sentence is saying there was not a single thing in the contract that had to be changed. And so Mr. Shepherd's clerks could start right away writing out copies for them to sign. Remember, this is before a copy machine. If you wanted two copies of a contract, you had to write out two copies. That's why lawyers have clerks to make duplicates, which means copies. So everything happens very quickly. I want to point out something earlier. Um, where is it? Here. Hearty begins with a consonant H. So it should be a hearty good humor. But in traditional British English, uh, H is considered a vowel. So it says unhearty. We don't do this today anymore. Some older people will still do this, but today it should be a hearty. Sir Walter, without hesitation, declared the Admiral to be the best looking sailor he had ever met with. Remember he was saying all sailors are ugly? And went so far as to say that if his own man might have had the arranging of his hair, he should not be ashamed of being seen with him anywhere. So 
he's still saying the admiral is not perfectly handsome. There's the one thing, his hair. So Sir Walter is saying, if I could get my guy to do your hair, you would be perfect. I would not be ashamed of being seen walking with you on the street. And the admiral with sympathetic cordiality. So this kind of means he doesn't really believe it, but he's repaying the kindness. Sir Walter likes him, so he feels like he should be polite and say something good about Sir Walter. Cordiality means kindness, a very polite kind of kindness. Sympathetic here means feeling the same way. Sympathy today means like to have pity on someone, but here it means to feel the same way. You can even say the mirror image. The Admiral observed to his wife as they drove back through the park. Uh, so they're driving the horse drawn carriage. Matsu. The park is the ground around the building as they're going through the ground on their way back. He said, I thought we should soon come to a deal, my dear, in spite of what they told us at Taunton. Ah, so before meeting Sir Walter, he did make some inquiries. In spite of, he thought we, here the word should means would. We would soon come to a deal. I expected we would very quickly come to a deal, no matter what they told us, what other people told us. The baronet, Sir Walter, will never set the Thames on fire, but there seems no harm in him. To set the Thames on fire means to create a sensation in the London social circle. So he's saying Sir Walter is not the most fashionable person. He's not the most high status. But there seems no harm in him. Reciprocal compliments, which would have been esteemed about equal. Esteemed means valued. So Sir Walter's compliment to the Admiral, the Admiral's compliment to Sir Walter, both are about equal, not 100% but enough to strike a deal. Uh, and if you didn't know, the Thames is the main river of London. Uh, speaking about the Thames, I do want to tell you, uh, have you guys heard of a newspaper called Taiwo Sibao? That's a mistranslation. The English title is The Times. Sibao. I don't know why Chinese translated into the Thames. Maybe somebody misheard the name or something. Uh, and this creates further confusion because if you're in the United States and you say the Times, people will think you're talking about the New York Times. But if you're in the UK and you say the Times, people will think you're talking about the Times newspaper. So in the US, if you want to talk about the British newspaper, you have to say the Times of London, even though it's that's not the name. Uh, one more paragraph. The Crofts were to have possession at Michaelmas. Uh, Michaelmas is a traditional religious holiday. Uh, it says here September 29. To have possession or to take possession here means to move in. And as Sir Walter proposed removing to Bath in the course of the preceding month, there was no time to be lost in making every dependent arrangement. So the plan is Sir Walter moves out and a month later these guys move in. And apparently there's not a lot of time to prepare. Uh, was no time to be lost. And so later, uh, the next paragraph is about how Anne will not go to Bath with her family immediately. And then the next few paragraphs are about how Anne has to take care of stuff as her family leaves her bath. OK, uh, and then you'll notice that they used to spell dependent differently. Today, this is D-E-N-T. 
Okay, questions? Great, finish up to chapter eight. See you next week.